better get me back, as it'll be dark soon, and they mostly come at night. Mostly. Welcome to Mostly Horror. Mostly. I'm Steve. And I am Sean. I feel like we normally have a bit of a lag in between when I hear, like, I hear you say, like, mostly, and it seems Mm -hmm. like you're far, you, like, are doing it late but it normally yeah. sounds better and i think it's because we normally share internet but right now uh we right now we're issue. all good yeah yeah there's like it feels wow. like no lag there's zero latency this yeah. is insane <laughs> which is crazy because we're moving in less than a week and so we'll have hopefully zero latency yeah after that. um yeah. another great interview and episode this week joined by director carter smith yeah, whose new film the passenger um mm-hmm. is uh by the time this episode's out um going to be out on vod and i believe mgm plus um carter also did the ruins um it's a good conversation um it's a good time before that there's some things that you probably already know i'm sure you already knew that you only tell me stuff i already know you already know what i'm going to tell you um that i want to talk about all, all these things are pretty exciting to me should I start? Should I, how should I start? Should I start with what I think is the biggest news, or should I end with what I think is the biggest news? I'm big on a I'm on a work your way up mentality. I, right. su- I support that. So let's work our way so, up to the biggest news. So starting with something that I just want to talk about because we're recording this on July 30th. Um, both Talk to Me and Haunted Mansion came out this week. Um, Talk to Me is opening with a $10 million um, opening weekend, which is A24's second biggest opening weekend, um, yeah. which is crazy um, yeah. You know, for an independent studio. Obviously, everyone knows A24, but um, it's second only to uh, Hereditary. And Talk To Me is a film that made or that was made for, I believe, like $8 million or like it's like four or eight million or something. So it's like already you know, exceeding expectations, I think doubling its projections. Um, That's amazing. Talk to me. We're going to talk about talk to me in the next episode. Um, Oh yeah, we are. Haunted Mansion Mm -hmm. uh, was able to rake in. uh, I think this is reporting as of, as of two hours ago, $24.2 million, which is more than talk to me. Sean, do you know how much uh, Haunted Mansion was made for? No, it's made for one hundred and fifty million dollars. Really? To put that into perspective, that is bigger budget than both Oppenheimer and Barbie, uh, yeah. two films which are raking in the cash currently. Oh my god! Um, on on all accounts, the reviews are are not great for Haunted Mansion. Um, right. Also, it's released in the middle of July, just like kind of Hocus Pocus was. Um, and yeah, it's it's. It's it's a a flop. Any thoughts? It feels it will it, a it's crazy that a movie making twenty four million dollars is a flop. Uh, but yeah, we'll <laughs> we'll say we'll say losing. uh yes. you know, not making its budget back. Like that's no, that's the thing. Like yeah, it's making a lot of money, but they spent one hundred and fifty <sighs> to make it. You know, sure. My thoughts are a that I mean, clearly studios are just completely not in tune with reality and they just assume that like we're disney and this is a big disney movie and that literally every person on the planet is going to go see it and they just don't realize that people a don't have funds right now and b are worried people don't even give a shit about aliens like people are like aliens whatever (laughs) they're and you expect them to run to to the theater to see yeah (laughs) and i don't know it's uh yeah making a movie for that much money is just is just nuts uh yeah and i yeah i feel like a lot of it goes to the cast in this sense you have lakeith right. stanfield rosario dawson owen wilson tiffany haddish danny devito jamie lee curtis jared leto like that is a yeah. that is a big old cast yeah and for not that many to people not that many people to see it, it's kind of crazy yeah so yeah that. and also do you think that um the strike in itself plays any any role in this or like that people might aim more of their frustration at a company like disney or no i don't i don't think that the layman is as familiar 
with what is happening with the strike sure. to the point where they would not go see a movie. That's where yeah. I think I'm falling yeah. currently. Um, and even people that are familiar with the strike are still going to go see a movie in right. my opinion. Um, well, yeah. I, yeah. I think it is. No one was asking for a haunted mansion remake. Mm-hmm. Um, even if they were, or even if Disney knows that they no one was asking for it, they picked a hell of a time to release it. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, <laughs> I I don't know if uh, I've seen like speculation online like they they want this streaming to hit during October, like they mm-hmm. wanted to hit Disney Plus in October so they can bump up their like third quarter streaming numbers with sure. Haunted Mansion, which like okay, but. I just don't I really don't understand it. Yeah. It's it's funny to me when I think about it. Uh there's I feel like Haunted Mansion like people think of the the Eddie Murphy uh, movie obviously mm-hmm. and you're either a person that loves that movie a lot and so you're going to be hesitant about this or you're going to be mm-hmm. a person that doesn't really care about that movie and probably just doesn't care about Haunted Mansion so you're not going to be running to this. And yeah. then there's this sub there's this small community of people that like really love the ride and don't necessarily love the eddie murphy movie you know what i mean yeah. it, it's a weird yeah it is a weird movie to put all of your eggs in or a weird yeah, basket to put all of your eggs it's in. like in october uh, I, and also i'm not saying every film has to come out on october 31st but or every mm-hmm. horror film needs to but for a film like haunted mansion you're yeah. trying you know the family you from disney's point of view i would be like we want to yeah. get families to come out for something that they think is like you know fun little spooky season thing and they could bring their kids to like a late September release or something, you know, like, right. Get it, but it's, I feel like a lot of films like that, like if they don't come out in October during that season, they're not going to do as well. Like even Dr. Sleep right. came out the first weekend of November. And I feel like it didn't do as well in theaters because it wasn't positioned like as well as it could be. Um, regardless, Haunted Mansion is being considered a flop. Uh, sure. Talk to me is not. And Barbenheimer is still ruling the theaters um trying in trying to really quick in trying to understand their logic i got like in my head and just completely correct me if you know better or whatever but i was like okay what would make them do this and then i remember that last year hocus pocus 2 came out and i was like how what was the budget of that movie and how much did it make and were they just trying to like replicate a boom that they saw last year go to theaters did it I don't think so. So that's I but but in my head I was like, am I missing something? I was just trying to understand. My brain yeah. just did I ADD don't, run in. But so okay. and on on the flip side, and a lot of people are referencing mm-hmm. this, Hocus Pocus, the the film came out in July. And I don't believe it did well in theaters. Yeah. And it yeah. but it became a cult classic, right? Um and that's just the way it goes. Weird. People aren't trying to go Weird. see spooky, you know, the the normal person's not trying to go see a spooky movie in july in the middle of the summer when all these blockbusters are coming out you had mission impossible followed by barbie and oppenheimer like come on and that's what cobweb is another example of that like literally came out the barbenheimer weekend and it should have been coming out in october um anyways fucking just these studios failing on every single like (laughs) every single facet right is yeah fucking insane Um, no clue what they're doing the second thing that you probably already know for our listeners. Um, Sean, have you seen anything about Saw X? Saw 10? Dude, Not all right, Saw listen. Twitter. <laughs> now that Twitter's I, called Yeah, X. Saw Twitter. God damn it. Um, I, uh, so I, I heard I heard that something came out, like a poster or an image was trailer. released. But that's, oh, a trailer. No, I, have, trailer. Oh, I haven't seen it. I yeah. yeah, was busy. What, uh, so there's, what's, the, there's a convention, what's the response button? Catch me there's up. a convention that was happening currently mm-hmm. called Midsummer Scream. I think today's the last day of it as we're recording this. Mm-hmm. Um, big horror convention. And that is where they they premiered the trailer for Saw 10. Um, the, a poster okay. did come out as well. It has a man with two uh, like fluorescent light bulb tubes like kind of on his eyeballs, yeah. uh, eyes, whatever, in the, in the shape of an X, which is kind of cool. Um, and I have do you want do you want a, an overview of what this film is yeah i mean go knowing on, that you shit. don't care about saw anymore okay yeah um <laughs> set between the events of saw one and saw two what a sick and desperate john travels to mexico for a risky and experimental medical procedure in hopes of a miracle cure for his cancer only to discover that the entire operation is a scam to defund the most vulnerable vulnerable 
The infamous killer returns to his work, turning the tables on the con artist in his signature visceral way through devious, deranged, and ingenious traps. Um, it is said to be the longest Saw film. And yeah, it is set. It is it is the it is John Kramer's story that is like from his yeah. I think POV and yeah, set between Saw One and Saw Two. So it's like a direct sequel to Saw One. Right. It's a it's a prequel spinoff. Uh, yeah, I don't. <laughs> I pre, don't it's under- a pre pre requel. Yeah, like I don't even. Whatever, man. It, they have just gotten so fucking goofy with this series for no reason. Um, you know, again, at this point, I'm the last saw that I, the last saw that I saw yeah. was Saw Seven, um, mm-hmm. and uh, so I haven't seen. I think after that was Jigsaw, and then Spiral yeah. are the two that I'm missing, and now, yeah, and now ten. So like eight, nine, yeah. ten. Yeah, okay. Uh, whatever. Who cares? Um. Yep. I guess I should catch up. You know, I've been saying that for years, though, and here I am, haven't haven't done it. This um, is uh, this is the director of Saw Six and Saw Three D. Um, also, the editor of just a bunch of horror films uh, yeah. is the director of this film. Mm-hmm. Um, I have oh, he edited Cobweb. I have uh, no care left in my body for this film. Mm-hmm. Um, it's interesting you- the take that they took. Uh, right. or are taking i also know amanda plays a big part in this one okay. um but yeah that's really all i got yeah i mean she would have to um didn't you see spiral no no maybe i'm thinking cam someone was telling me that like oh, spiral was kind of cool all right yeah whatever i, I did yeah, i was saw. i was curious if the premise would be any any sway in your mind um, listen guys write us write us and tell us what you think about saw i need i need to know everyone else's thoughts on this because i'm so i'm fed up and i'm i'm trying to figure out like who are the people that are like like drooling over another saw movie i'm not trying to hate on you if, the, it's if it's probably, your if you're still into it but just ex- defend yourself all right <laughs> explain yeah. yourself to me <laughs> to our to our point about haunted mansion it is probably an easy to make low budget horror film yeah. with name recognition it is one of the most popular horror franchises in the past couple decades. Yeah. And they can, you know, they don't stop coming and they don't stop coming and they don't stop coming. <laughs> it's just the way that it goes. Oh my God. Unfortunately. Are you ready for the big news? The big, the big yeah. rumor. I will, I will say, I will not call this news because I don't know if oh, it's news. I think I know. I think I know. Are you big sure? Rumor. Maybe say it. All right. As previously rumored in April of this year, insiders are now confirming that Matt Bettinelli Olpin and Tyler G- Gillette, aka two thirds of Ready or Not, will not okay. be returning to direct another Scream movie. <sighs> yeah, so is that is what I thought. What I thought. Um, you know, I I I felt like when they didn't immediately say it after Scream Six that we mm-hmm. weren't gonna get. Um, them coming back, and also they're they're taking on other projects and doing a lot of shit, right? I just kind of assumed. Um, there is rumors. So obviously, we had radio silence on the show. Uh, there's rumors that another one of our guests may be taking over at the helm of Scream Seven. Yes, Christopher Landon. Christopher Landon. Yeah. Uh, the yeah, rumors we, we... are. Simply because he has followed uh, the core four, if you will, um, on Instagram, yeah. they followed him back, and who knows what that means, but it's it's possibly a fair assumption. Yeah. Well, I like I love that it's him. If that's the case, you know what I mean. Like it's I mm-hmm. feel like like that makes me less stressed out about it. Right. Uh, and I I believe in Christopher Landon. Uh, with that being said, I really think that Radio Silence was building this thing. And when you're building up, I uh, I just I hate when stories get handed over to somebody else in the middle of what's going on. And so, I mean, Scream, Scream 6 does not feel like, uh, you know, the end of a story to me. I feel yeah. like there's, you know, we're waiting for our third act. And um, 
and yeah, so I, but at the same time, I, it's still like the same people writing, right? Yeah. Um, same people. Yeah. Yep. And I, again, I mean like Chris, Chris's strengths and his, his film tone and stuff, it, it does seem to really serve this franchise. So it could be just totally. a fresh thing to do. Like maybe, maybe some fresh eyes for the final, the third act is exactly what we need. Yeah. Uh, so I'm open to it is, is what I'm saying. I'm, I'm bummed on one end, but I'm excited on the other. Uh, yeah. That's where I'm, I'm I'm yeah. glad that Radio Silence get to do other things and aren't just like stuck in Scream now for year for a couple of years. Um, but yeah, to that point, yeah, uh, I love Radio Silence's work. I have enjoyed everything that they've done with the Scream franchise. But I also think that yeah, you know, what Chris did specifically with Freaky, um, yeah. is really like the tone that you want, in my opinion. Sure, like, there is some good shit in Freaky. Um, and his other films that I feel like will translate really well to the Scream universe. Again, this is not verified. <laughs> this is just a rumor. Right. Um, but, you know, hopefully we can come back and, and if it is not Radio Silence, confirm that um, Christopher Landon will be the one taking the helm. Um, yeah, like I said, it's it's exciting to think that he would be next in line. Um, it's right. funny because I've seen that f- going from Scream 2 to Scream 3, the writer changed. Um, there was a new writer on Scream 3, uh, similar to what's happening now, where the directors are changing. Writers are staying sure. the same. Um, so, yeah, I saw that, honestly, like right before we hopped on and thought it was interesting. Hell, yeah. Um, I heard a rumor that makes me think of uh, Umbrella Academy. But I heard a rumor. The direction I thought you were going was, and this is so, I have not looked into it at all. Guys, I've been at a, a convention all weekend um, doing some traveling. I'm I'm back in Michigan. Uh, things have been hectic. So I saw this like yesterday or the day before. Haven't gotten any chance to look into it. But I thought you were going to talk about the rumor that Del Toro is uh, creating his own universal monster universe, that they're just handing it over to him. Um I saw like a quick thing about that Frankenstein producer says del Toro is building his own monster universe. Um, uh, so I do see that. Yeah. So, but I don't know, again, I don't know how valid I, I haven't gotten to look into it. If you, if you find some quick so, stuff. Mm. So here's the thing, I guess for those who don't know, he is doing Frankenstein for Netflix. Del Toro is okay. making a Frankenstein film for Netflix. Fuck yeah. Um, and yeah, I'm seeing on, on 717 a couple weeks ago, the producer of Guillermo del Toro's Frankenstein says that after projects with Universal's classic monsters f- movies fell through, the director is building his own monster universe starring, starting with The Shape of Water as his creature from the Black Lagoon. Love it. Love it. Literally love it. It's That's exactly what I would ask for. Like, I feel like there's even a hypothetical conversation or seven that I've had in the future about, like, who would you in want the to remake these? Uh, <laughs> in the how, did you, how did you know uh, that? Uh, um, I don't, yeah, I just, it's, I feel like I manifested this yeah. because I, yeah. Um, so 100% down if that's true, but it's, I guess we'll. It's exciting to think about. I mean, Franken, like, I'm pretty sure Frankenstein has Oscar Isaac. Andrew Garfield and Mia Goth is the cast. Um, Run it. Which is dope. So, yeah, I'm I'm excited about that. Um, and hopefully he does build out the universe. That would be sick. I don't Fuck know how it. that would work with yeah. Netflix and Universal, but I don't know. Who knows? Del Toro can do whatever he wants. People just say <laughs> yes. They write That's him a true. blank fucking check and they say, go make go make a masterpiece. Unla- unless it's Haunted Mansion, before. then they'll scrap it and they'll put it out in the middle of July and it won't do shit. That's he true. was supposed to wake the Haunted right. Mansion movie originally, so there yeah, but he well, he's attached, dude. Del Toro gets his fingies on everything at one point or another, and then decides what he does and doesn't want to. It's it's on the studio if, he, if he gets his fingies on it, and they don't end up making it. <laughs> that's that's on them. Um, all right, that's a a good amount of things that you probably already know. Uh, we have a great conversation with Carter Smith coming up. Sean, any final thoughts about our chat with Con- Carter? No, I think the conversation speaks for itself. Uh, Carter's got a lot of great insight. It's it's a good talk, and I'm excited for you guys to hear it. Yeah, Carter's uh, doing this interview from a Oceanside 
cottage yeah. in Maine, which is we still got one of the cooler places that we've interviewed someone from. Um, so hope you guys enjoy our conversation with Carter Smith, the director of The Passenger. Uh, stick around for our mostly horror recommendations of the week. All right, we are joined today by Carter Smith. Carter is a filmmaker photographer known for his films The Ruins, Swallowed, and The Passenger, which comes out on MGM Plus and VOD on August 4th. Carter, thanks for joining us today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Absolutely. Yeah, so we always like to start off our interviews. Uh, a, we have a question we'll ask in a bit, but we, we like to mm -hmm. go a little off topic with our first questions. And if I'm not mistaken, you own or run a number of oceanfront cottages on an island in Maine. I think I saw yes. on your Instagram, you're posting photos from it. It looks absolutely gorgeous. Can you talk about, you know, you're, you're from the area, from Maine at least. Can you talk yeah. about what that area means to you? What those, those I'm sure, idyllic cottages mean to you? Yeah. Yeah, so I, I grew up here. I grew up, um, I was born on Bailey Island, which is in southern Maine. Um, <clears throat> I, you know, after high school, I basically was like, get me out of here. I want to go to New York city and left yeah. like the second I graduated from <laughs> high school. Um, and then, you know, after like 10, 12, 13 years, like I would come back and I'd be like, Oh, it's actually kind of nice here. Like, you know, and, um, there's, there's one little cottage, which is actually the, the, where exactly where I am right now. And it was, it was owned by, this guy who was a friend of my parents and he was like a sort of flamboyant bachelor type that ran the department store in town and like had these, I mean, I don't remember any of this really. Like he had these parties here and like, I've heard all of these stories and he had this beautiful little cottage on the rocks. And I mean, I have pictures of myself as a baby on the porch at this house. Um, and at one point this, this cottage became available and I, you know, luckily was in a position to be able to snap it up. And, um, and, and since then, like the house next door became available and then the house next door became available and then the house across the street became available. And I have like this, like pr separate from like being a photographer and being a filmmaker, like I'm, I'm like a huge like I love renovating house mm -hmm. old houses right. okay. and sort of creating like these spaces. And so like for, you know, 10 years, I just like bought and renovated these, these little cottages that are, they're all right on the ocean. And, um, you know, I live in one and then the rest of them are uh, vacation rentals. And I sort of like have created these weird Gothic, uh, like, you know, there's like in one, there's like a revolving bookcase that goes to a secret bathroom and like all of them have <laughs> like one of them is haunted and one of like they all are like stocked with Stephen King books and they all, yes. you know, I sort of, <laughs> you know, bent over backwards to create this like weird little version of dark, stormy, gothic Maine that wow. um, oh I'm God. kind of obsessed with. Yeah. 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 I've, so I've been fun. <laughs> I've been wanting to visit Maine. So like Sean and I are both in New York. I've been wanting to visit uh -huh, yeah. Maine for some time. So now I know exactly where to go when I visit yeah. Maine. This is yeah. perfect. Yeah, totally. And I, I do. We do. A, I do a killer haunted house. Uh, I was going to ask. The, yeah, I saw. Yeah. I saw. You know, you you guys close uh, for rentals around. It said the Gills Halloween Party and Haunted House. So can you talk about yeah. what the what that is? Yeah, so the one of that one of the I mean the the group is called the Gills Group and um like of all the cottages, but the one of the cottages is called the Gills and it's the uh it's the it's like a, a 19 or the one I'm in was eight was built in 1890. The mm -hmm. then they built uh the Gills around 1912 and it's like this incredible, you know, spot that like you know, it's, it's historic. It's not ever been renovated. It's not ever been like tampered with. And, um, I have one little niece and we started having Halloween parties when she was little and like as a horror director and like photographer, I went above and beyond and like, <laughs> you know, like really would spend like weeks up here, like working on scenarios and sets and props and all kinds of stuff. The, 
the life of a freelancer, you know, wow. yeah, like, you have time for this stuff. <laughs> you're living my dream. Like <laughs> yeah. New York right out of high school. I came here late. I'm already, I got the homesickness where I'm like, ah, I've only been here like almost two years and I'm, but cottage, uh, waterside and you, and you can almost like basically like built your own community and have private Halloween yeah, party. House. It's super that, fun. That's, super that's fun. amazing. Um, I mean, the best is when like, you know, like I've, I've done it a couple of times where I've had a bunch of friends come up yeah. and we just take over all the houses and like, <laughs> oh and everyone sort of like dinner at one house and then like a walk through the woods to go to somewhere else for, you know, games and then yes. drinks at someone else's. It's like, it's super fun. It's a big oh, block man. party with, <laughs> just I, with yeah. All yeah. The, yeah. And, yeah. And with fun Gothic cottages with revolving bookshelves and stuff like that. Exactly. It's <laughs> the exactly. coolest thing in the world to me. Um, <laughs> So, so Carter, I, I want to ask uh, another one of our favorite questions to ask every guest that we bring on the show. Um, clearly, spooky is in your blood. Uh, it seems like it, it's probably been that way for a minute. So uh, I want to ask about your introductions to the genre. Um, we're looking for those moments where maybe you came out into the living room late at night and saw something from behind the couch that you weren't supposed to see, or you had, yeah. you know, an, an older friend or family member expose you to something a little early. Uh, if you could share a memory like that with us, that would be great. Yeah. So like, I mean, the, the first thing that comes to mind is like, I was a horror fan. Like I was, you know, we would go to the video store every Tuesday when my little sister had ballet class and you know, while she was in ballet class, we would go to, the, I'd go to the video store. And so like, and then we go to pick her up after her lesson. And there was this one mom there who had a kid in the class and she would always see the movies that I was showing up with. And she was like, and I was probably like 11. And she was like, Oh, you like horror movies. And I was like, yeah, you know, but it was like very standard, like fair, like, you know, the burning and Friday the 13th and, mm -hmm. you know, uh, that very kind of small town video store staples. Yeah. And the next week she brought me like an unmarked tape and, you know, and it was the brood. And I just, I like, I remember taking it home and watching it and just being kind of floored by everything about it from like the weird little monster children to yeah. like, to, I think that also like, it's such a stylish movie and like, even as a little 11 year old, I was like pretty aware of, of that kind of stuff. I mean, I don't think I understood it, but I was aware of it. And I was like, I like her hair and like that, you know, that outfit is really good. And that room, that lamp, like there was so much of the, like the aesthetic of it that mm -hmm. I was super into. But then of course, like the horror of it all, I was, you know, obsessed with. Um, of course. Yeah. And that probably really messed with me, you know, very early on. <laughs> I like that you had you had already been exposed, you know, to the genre and you're talking about them just being staples like cookie cutter. Uh, well, I don't know that that's exactly what you said, but yeah, then you yeah. had this other movie come in. Do you do you remember like what kind of gave you the bug in the first place uh, that, that even got you onto the cookie cutter stuff? Was it was it just like normal in your family? Your parents were fine with you? watching? No, anything? not at all. I mean, I was I was, you know, I was I I don't even I don't know where it came from. Like, I think that it was I mean, I'd been like kind of into like mysteries and and hardy boy type stuff and mm, okay. you know watched i mean i i i remember seeing dark knight of the scarecrow the tv movie yeah it's now on shutter i think yeah or somewhere but like I, I saw that pretty pretty young and you know kind of fell in love with that but i don't like i, I mean i think it comes from like i i started maybe reading books before i started seeing movies like I remember reading Jaws in 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 fifth grade or yeah fifth grade, and then which was you know too young, and then sure. <laughs> quickly moving to like Carrie and you know those sorts of books. So it was probably yeah. more books that started me on on okay. horror than films. And you um, you obviously talked about you know stocking King's Stephen King book in your um in your cottages. Is is he? I'm sure he's a main staple. Obviously, you know is yeah. Uh, you know, he, I remember seeing, uh, when the ruins came out, which we'll talk about Stephen King said it was one of his favorite, you know, films of the year. Like is, is he, he and his work, something that's influenced you at all? Yeah. I mean, I think like both in that, you know, growing up in Maine where sometimes it can feel pretty like, uh, does anybody ever get out? Like, mm. you know, I mean, this was, this was a while ago too. So it was like, you know, it kind of felt like, oh, someone 
someone from Maine is doing something cool. Yeah. And like now there's all kinds of like, you know, heritage oyster bespoke, you know, wine <laughs> growing, you know, like right. all that shit. Right. But like at the time right. it was like, oh, there's someone who writes like scary books and he's from Maine and I'm from Maine too. And maybe I can tell stories in a way that like, you know, scares people. Um, and I think that like, you know, especially a lot of the early stuff of his, I mean, all of his stuff, but he's such a masterful storyteller. Mm -hmm. Like a couple of years ago, I went back and reread The Shining. And, you know, I think that like we all forget about the book, The Shining, because we're also familiar with the movie. But if you read that book, it is like he is setting stuff up on page five and page 10. And like, it's like a master class in, yeah. in, in storytelling. It's I um I had I'm one of the people that had seen the movie like years and years before I ever read the book. I only read the book for the first time uh, a couple years ago and was just floored at I, I love the movie, but at how much more I enjoy the book than the movie drastically. Yeah. I mean, yeah, the um the uh, I can't think of what to call them, but like the bush animals alone have had me just internally begging for a mini series or something <laughs> like a, a revamped yeah. <laughs> mini series uh, that that stays a little bit more true to that. But but you're absolutely right. Um, also, co correct us if we're wrong, but uh, we read somewhere that you are a big Cronenberg fan as well. And I I, I personally well, think that brood, I saw yeah. that. Well, yeah, well, yes, yes. Um, but uh, yeah, I I felt like i could see a lot of that in um or at least just just certain certain shots made me think that you you might be into cronenberg before we even read it uh in things like swallowed and stuff when did cronenberg's work come into, into i mean that was the brood 100 percent. that was the first just, time i'd ever even yeah, yeah. and then like i and then after that i i think i requested from the video store like to get the other films and like nice. you know i mean it, it did sort of a deep dive into you know all the early stuff i mean at sure. like 12. You know what I mean? Like requesting yeah. like rabid and, you know, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, but I think that there's, you know, there's, there's something about the mix of like style and, and scares that always fascinated me. Mm -hmm. um, and he, you know, like even, even, you know, Videodrome, I mean, rabid and, and some of the earlier ones are a little rougher, but like, you know, Videodrome is so stylish and yeah. the brood is, you know, I, I just, I really loved that um kind of attention to the aesthetics of it yeah more you know because so many of those movies that i was you know watching at the time are just like counselors get killed yeah, you know vibe. girl yeah. in shower walks around and you know like there wasn't like an attention to detail that i that i could see mm -hmm. um there is something about his movies admittedly i'm i'm still uh i i've only really put like my foot in the door into exploring all of his movies i've, I've only seen a handful I, I need to do the rest but every time he's really good at setting a mood of discomfort immediately that i at least for yeah. me that i don't really understand um i am uneasy the second that i put the movie in with his stuff I, and I, I don't know what it is about it um, yeah that's like something know. to aspire to that's what i that's what i that's <laughs> what i would I, that's my my aspiration is to to be able to do that same have that same effect yeah i think yeah uh, i feel like knowing you're going into a Cronenberg film, it, it, just walking into yeah. the theater, like, to, you know, yeah. turning it on. Yeah. Yeah. So you, um, so you, clearly you had this, this love of, of spooky and, and storytelling early, but you ended up, you, you jumped into photography and specifically like fashion photography. I know that yeah. you, you did, um, shoots for, for magazines like Vogue, GQ, W magazine. Uh, you've done several celebrity yeah. shoots. How, how did you kind of get into into like what was that journey like entering into that world and then coming back to this love of of storytelling and was it did you kind of always see it as almost like a step into that world in general or i you know i i i didn't i i i wanted to go to film school and mm -hmm. i wanted to go to nyu film school and i sort of assumed that i might not get in and so i applied to fit the Fashion Institute of Technology, because I knew that no matter what I was going to do, I was going to move to New York City. So sure. I was like, okay, well, if I don't get into NYU, at least I can go to FIT. I'll get in there and I'll get myself to New York. And at the like, I got into NYU and at the last minute, I was like, because I'd been taking, like all through high school, I'd been taking pictures and setting up elaborate photo shoots and doing the makeup and drawing and you know, making costume outfits and costumes and stuff. And so it kind of 
there was this attraction for me of like jumping right in in the first year into doing stuff and to taking classes in because I, I started I started out studying fashion design. So mm. I like I mean, I, you know, I would not be a good designer. I never really even wanted to be a designer, I don't think. But like um, what was exciting was like, OK, I'm going to start immediately taking design classes instead of going to NYU and taking like a, you know, a core curriculum for a year before I ever took right. a film class. Sure. And, I, you know, the photography just became a way to like kind of tell stories and 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 create scenarios and it was more accessible than than film because this was before you know we all had 4k cameras in our pockets and right. and you know it just there seemed like there was this like technical barrier that i was kind of avoiding by you know because a, a stills camera like i could figure that out and i could it wasn't too expensive and i was you know i was shooting film and and i met and you know got to be friends with this whole crew of of kids at at uh fit um who were all like super fashionable like you know kind of fun party kid we all this this group of us sort of came up together and um you know after a while it kind of i mean it kind of took off in a way that was unexpected and you know it, it was literally like you know i had i had one set of pictures come out that i had taken while i was traveling around the south and it was like portraits of like you know a weird looking carny kid and like some skateboarders and like a weird little girl that you know i mean it was, it was like a little bit sketchy and creepy um and they ran you know they they ran as a story in uh this british magazine id and like the day that that story came out like i got an agent i got a job for vogue i got the levi's campaign wow. and like basically it was it was like 10 years of fast forward like just one after the other after the other bigger better more you know all of it and i was kind of like okay i'm i'm here for this this is like a fun ride like you want to send me to paris you want to pay me how much you want to like yeah. I, you want me to shoot who like sure yeah, yeah. go <laughs> um and it was only after like you know i was like maybe 15 years of doing that i was i was like oh fuck, i want to make movies like what am i doing and so i made bug crush which was my first uh mm -hmm. short film and it was really, you know, I, I was in a position where like I had already been working with all of these people like production designer and costume and hair and makeup. And, and so I, I had this like team of creative people around me and I was like, we're making a movie. And I kind of figured it would be this sort of thing that like, you know, 50, 40 people might see like as a weird little queer horror movie about mm -hmm. like longing. And, you know, I mean, it, it's, it was definitely not something that I thought would end up finding an audience the way that it did um and we ended up winning at sundance like yeah which is fucking inc you know that's like your yeah, best amazing. case scenario as a first yeah. time filmmaker yeah it's insane yeah. did really it really hit the ground running did then. it yeah i mean i i also it seems great to have you, you kind of seem like a jack of all trades sort of guy. I mean, you talk, you know, not to keep jumping back to the cottages, but like you're essentially talking about production design with what you're doing with the cottages. You're talking about, yeah, you know, yeah. um, costuming and, and, and having an eye for that sort of thing, you know, going into photography, obviously lends your um, self as a director towards like the cinematography aspect of things. Yeah. So you already have that eye. Um, I'm curious if that's like, if that's something you really focus on, like, I mean, obviously if people watch your films, they'll, they'll see that you do, but I'm curious your own take on what you're focusing on when you're directing. Cause you have, you know, even in, but even watching bug crush now on like Vimeo or, or wherever we were able to watch it online. Like you, you have these pretty good, um, pretty close close-ups, um, and like very yeah. specific shots that you're choosing. Um, so I'm curious how your photography background lends itself to what you're doing now as a director. Yeah. Well, I mean, the fun thing about being a director is you get to do all of it. Right. Like you yeah. get to be in charge of, <laughs> of production design and hair and makeup and wardrobe and where the camera is and what the, you know, you're, yeah. you're kind of, you know, you're doing all of it. So that's, that's, you know, cause I, I, I really enjoy all of the aspects of it. Um, you know, like, so for me, it's kind of fun to oversee everything. Um, I mean, definitely coming from stills, you know, I learned a bunch of stuff, which was, has been super helpful. Like I, I learned how to run a set, you know, mm -hmm. which I think that indie filmmakers or first time filmmakers are often like, don't really 
necessarily know how to run a set. And, and that was something that I've been doing for, for years. Um, and then, you know, dealing with clients and, and sort yeah. of, and dealing with personalities and sort of that whole skill set, you know, because I've, I've done a ton of advertising, like that comes in super handy when you're like, you know, dealing with notes and trying to make of everyone course. feel heard and li feel like they're, you're listening to what they're saying and try to get behind <laughs> what they're really saying. And you know, so there's a lot of like people skills that are, yeah. and that are, that are different from, you know, the, the actual, maybe the more expected stuff of like, Oh, I know how to put a camera and how to light. And like that stuff is, is, is great. But I think it's the other stuff that was the big surprise and how, how, how much it came in handy. Yeah. Like those, sure. those intangibles essentially that you got, yeah. like that. Yeah. The people skills like the, yeah. yeah. That ability to, to communicate and coordinate. Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm curious what's harder to deal with fashion clients or like film and TV <laughs> industry clients. I mean, probably fashion clients to be honest. Yeah. Cause I mean, at the end of the day, you're, you're selling like a dress or, a, yeah. you know, a, a hairspray or a perfume or, and I mean, in one way it's, 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 you know, I mean, it's kind of ephemeral cause it's, it's sort of, it, it, it goes, it goes away, you know, mm. quickly, you know, like it, it's not like a film, which, which kind of stays forever. And I feel like with, with film and with, with stories that are told in film, like there's more conversation to have about mm. why you want to do something. And there's sort of a, a better case to make for, you know, if you're trying to do something that people disagree with or that people don't understand, like if you have a good reason for it, that's often something that people will listen to. Yeah. Sure. It know? also just, it just feels like fashion is, I mean, like, obviously, film and TV seems very cutthroat. I mean, we're recording this during the, mil the middle of the WGA and, and SAG strike. Um, but on, on the other hand, like fashion just seems like so cutthroat. I mean, I, I saw on TikTok I've seen I Devil think, Wears like, a Prada. couple weeks ago. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've seen, you know, on TikTok a couple weeks ago, like the this like Wilhelmina casting that just has hundreds and hundreds of people crowding the streets in like Chelsea or wherever they were. Like it just, it seems like an industry where you're really you know, like at the whim of someone's snap of a finger, whereas film and TV, yeah, at least you have a little bit to move. Yeah. And someone could decide like, Oh, it's your time. And then, and yeah. then, or, you know, or not. Yeah. Um, and when they, when they say it's your time, great, uh, you know, you run with it and, you know, do what you do what you can. Um, but it's a, it's a tough business because you kind of have to wait for other people to, you know, give you that opportunity. It's, it's, it's less of a place where you can make opportunities of your own sometimes. Fair. Sure. That's a good way to put yeah, it. Yeah, absolutely. I want to bring up, I, I have to bring up the, the idea of bugs as drugs. Uh, you know, it, it seems like bug crush is obviously fairly tied. I kind of see bug crush and swallowed as existing in the same universe. Uh, yeah, after yeah, watching sure. both of them. Yeah. Um, so I'm just curious, like why that, was like a reoccurring theme for you and uh, and kind of the things you were touching on there. I know you said with Bug Crush, you said uh, a story about longing. I also see things, uh, you know, like like peer pressure, sexual assault, uh, forfeiting or, uh, you know, having body autonomy taken from you. Um, yeah. Could you talk a little bit about sort of that metaphor and, yeah. and that premise? Well, I mean, the, you know, Bug Crush was based on a short story by Scott Trey Levin, who it was it's an incredible short story. And so, you know, that was where, that was where it started. And then, you know, it was kind of one of those things, like if, if I had made, um, if I had made Bug Crush and then wanted to do a feature of it, like I could have done it like just that year. I you know, like immediately when it came out, there was people like, Oh, do you want to make a feature? What do you want to do? And mm -hmm. like, and I kind of felt like, okay, Bug Crush is like a, is a, is kind of a, I mean, to me, like a complete story like it's a it's a it's a self-contained you know kind of it was exactly what it was meant to be yeah and it was only after like you know all of these years later and sort of dealing with you know a lot of the you know big studio stuff and then like trying to get you know with jamie marks is dead trying to get like a sort of little ish or yeah fairly little indie made and sold at sundance like the the business of all the hollywood stuff kind of was a trap that I got kind of caught in for quite a while. And so I, I had decided that I wanted to do a, uh, you know, a micro budget 
like just like literally like eight, nine people in the woods, like, you know, friends and family, you know, making a movie. Um, and it, so it seemed like the right world to return to for that. Like I'm in Maine. I knew I was going to shoot it in Maine. I, I was like, okay, what do I have at my disposal? I have like, you know, I've got a white Jeep. I've got like a fishing camp in the woods that my dad built off the grid. Um, I've got like, you know, so I, I knew all of these things that I had and I was like, okay, what, what story can I tell using these? And it just kind of came to me this idea of crossing the border and, you know, returning to the idea of bugs as drugs. Um, I, I have always loved, I mean, I'm a big fan of like supernatural and, you know, everything scary, but I also love grounded horror and grounded you know, scary stuff that is like maybe a half step away from being possible or real. Yeah. Um, and so these bugs kind of, they fit that bill, you know, really well for me because they're, you know, they're, they're mysterious and they're sort of other, but they're also completely plausible, you know? Yeah. A hundred percent. It's, it's so invasive too. Like it, it, like there's just something about that story of, of swallowing these, these things that oh, I never, yeah. Yeah, I also love that you, I, at least in, in Swallow, that you don't get like this full, this full view of. Um, yeah. 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 Sorry. Uh, Steve, were you going to say something? Like you With, were well, so remember. going back to like creating this, this, you know, micro budget or, or at least smaller budget film in Swallowed, I, I read an article you talking about it and kind of, they they described it as making your second debut feature. Like you you yeah. after the um, release of Bug Crush, you get onto the Ruins, which is this huge film released by DreamWorks, um, and it, it's it's a I mean it's a great film. And I'm but I'm curious, you know, what you're learning at that point where you're making this huge major major motion picture that made you want to go back to the smaller film. Is it really just like the intimacy and the is it more control over what you're creating? <clears throat> Um, yeah. or is it just like the style of filmmaking that you prefer? I, well, I had never made a film like that before. Like oh, even right, bug, right, right. bug crush was, was, was two, three times the size and budget of swallowed. Wow. Like, I that. so oh. I had, you know, I sort of, it was more than anything. And it wasn't like I made the ruins and then was like, Oh no, I want to see what it looks like to make a tiny little movie. Like right. I wanted to, you know, I didn't want to necessarily make big movies, but I wanted to make movies that people could see and that people could, you know, I could get financed. And, and that proved to be like, not the easiest thing. Like mm -hmm. I, I, you know, Jamie Marks is dead is a film that I spent years trying to get made and nobody wanted to make it. And, you know, it's, it's, it's a, weird little movie it's kind of sits between genre and coming of age and a ghost story and like it it was an incredible experience but it was also really frustrating to to kind of realize how difficult it was to make the sorts of movies that i wanted to make um you know and then i made midnight kiss and i was going back and forth with photography and and it was only after like you know years and years of of developing stuff and having it fall apart for one reason or another that i I was like, okay, like I spend all of this time complaining to myself that it's so hard to get movies made and that, you know, why, why is it, does it have to be this hard? And I was like, you know, I'm listening to these podcasts about micro budget filmmaking and reading stories about like mumble gore and, you know, mm -hmm. all of these like, and I was like, there, I like, I know how to make movies. Why am I not doing this? Like the only reason I'm not doing this is because like, I don't even have a reason. And when, once I kind of hit that wall, I was like, okay, I'm going to write something that, that fits in this scale and, yeah. and figure it out. Like I know how to schedule a movie. I know how to, you know, shoot a movie. I know how to, you know, I mean, I did all the catering. I cooked all of our food. Like I did everything. And, you know, if for no other reason, just to prove that to myself that I could do it. And so, you know, that I don't ever have the excuse in the future of like, you know, oh, I can't make that movie. Like, no, I'm right, like, yeah. I, now I know how to make a movie like that. I, I never have an excuse not to make a movie again. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's the thing that like, you know, people tell, or the, even the advice that we've, we've gotten on the show from other directors is like, just go out and make something, you know, for like kind yeah. of advice for first time filmmakers. You talked about the kind of the barrier of entry, which is less and less now with, with iPhones yeah. and things like that. But 
um that is you know the advice normally for for first-time filmmakers is just go and make it and it's great to hear that that's even like you know when you have a story that you want to make or a space that you want to make it in it's still just go and make it and it's great it's great yeah. that you did yeah. too because it's also leading into the passenger which is why we have yeah. today you know talking about the newest film um which is you know you talked about jamie marks dead kind of being in between genres i think the passenger is a little bit of that as well it's very mostly yeah. horror i think we would call it on the show as the name of our show um yeah. i'm i'm curious you you have a good mix of your work where you've written directed some and then you've just directed other people's work so with yeah. this one you're you're being attached to a script or you're you're getting a script um can you walk us through like what the the genesis of the project was like with this yeah you, blumhouse has this interesting um you know, I, I think it was the Epic deal and it turned into MGM yep. plus with their like straight to streaming. Yeah. They're like production model where they, I mean, it's very much like TV, you know, they, yeah. they work with a, a set group of, of department heads and production offices and all, all that stuff. And then they rotate in, you know, director, uh, producer, DP sort of come in, at, you know, different for each project. Mm -hmm. Um, I had done, I had done Midnight Kiss uh, with them for the Into the Dark series for Hulu, right, yeah. right? And with with Lauren Downey producing and Lynn Moncrief as the DP, and so when there was there was one slot left of this Epic's MGM uh, series of films that they were doing, and we had looked for like they had sent me a couple scripts. We we had a really good experience working on Midnight Kiss together, and so we talked mm -hmm. about doing something else. And there was a couple scripts that they sent, and I just I wasn't like ready to spend a year or two years like on anything. And mm -hmm. so I sort of asked and I said, are you open to like, if I can go out and find a script that that works for this model, like, is, is that something you would be open to? And they said, sure. Um, and so I, fa I went to Jack Stanley, who wrote The Passenger, and he had I'd read a bunch of his stuff before he's written some great stuff that has not been made yet, and asked and sort of gave him the parameters of, of what you know, the film needed to be like what, what size, what scope. And mm -hmm. he pulled out the passenger, which was one of the first scripts that he had ever written and kind of dusted it off and, and, you know, and it kind of fit perfectly with, you know, what the types of film and the, the size of film that they were looking to do. Um, so I brought it to them. And even though it's kind of not really like an obvious choice, maybe mm -hmm. for what the, you know, fits in the Blumhouse box, like, it was exciting enough that they, you know, they were willing to kind of take a chance on it and do something that wasn't, you know, as horror as a lot of the other stuff that they were doing. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, so we got the, so luckily like it came together in a way that like was, you know, it was, it was super exciting because it's also, uh, you know, I mean, I, I read the script and I just fell in love with, with Benson and Randy and like mm -hmm. the weird messed up friendship that they have over the course of the film with the size of the film like moving from swallowed uh, like i feel like we keep talking yeah. about the scale of the film but moving from swallowed to this which is still more pared down is that something that you're like a sweet spot maybe of the type of things that you're interested in making um i mean swallowed was was really small swallowed was eight people like we had right. a crew of eight and then you know we shot in 15 days and you know, then, you know, but, but the passenger was you know, like a, you know, a full movie, like, mm -hmm. yeah, like a real movie, like a union, you know, production right. with, you know, trailers and the process, like everything that you would want or need to make a movie. Um, and it, it wasn't like extravagant by any means. It's still like a contained story, but it's sort of, you know, it, it was definitely a different scope than, than swallowed. But what was interesting, what was great was, you know, I was able to, work with, you know, Eric Naj, who's uh, the editor on mm -hmm. Swallowed, came and edited The Passenger. Christopher Bear, who did the score for Swallowed, also did the score for The Passenger. Gotcha. And so there was a bunch of kind of like, you know, people that I was able to sort of bring along from that from that project that, you know, because it's great to, you know, establish those creative relationships where you can, you know, you you have you're not working together for the first time and spend the first half of your time together trying to figure out the best way to communicate. You know, there yeah. was, there was a great opportunity to like, you know, hit the ground running and, um, and, and make something really special. Yeah. yeah. I'm 
blown away over and over again by uh by realizing just how small the production was for swallowed because while it you know it yeah. feels like a you know it, it feels like an, an an indie movie to a certain degree it does not feel like that it's just very impressive that you guys were able to pull that off and especially so fast uh with so few people i read uh an interview you did with fango talking about you know you guys all sleeping like eight people in a room oh, in the bear uh, camp bunk yeah, beds. yeah the, two, a ton of rooms. bears yeah, yeah absolutely two insane. rooms like what eight uh, people in each room yeah <laughs> Yeah, absolutely nuts. Um, to, to go back to the passenger really quick, you, you talked about falling in love with, um, you know, with their relationship. And I that's something that we wanted to explore for sure. Uh, it seems like there's a lot of themes there, uh, you know, the, possibly commenting on toxicity and in, in male masculinity and the relationship with ourselves mm -hmm. and the world. And um, could you talk a little bit about why that relationship resonated with you and and what exactly you, you were trying to say? um, with this movie? Yeah. I mean, I think that the, you know, the, the main thing that I would, the first time that I read the script, the sort of the thing that I hooked into was this idea that like this really kind of tender, unexpected relationship developed between these two under conditions that it shouldn't. Mm -hmm. And, you know, horrible stuff has happened. And yet, you know, as I got sort of halfway through the script, I was like, I was rooting for Benson. And I was like, I was wanting him to be, and he's, you know, he's done horrible things at this point. Like I should not be rooting for him. And I just wanted him to be okay. And I wanted him to, you know, to kind of find what it was he was looking for. And, you know, in a lot of ways, I saw myself a lot in the Randy character, like as a high school kid who was just like, wanted nothing more than to disappear and not get picked on and like cause as little friction as possible so that I could just get to New York. Um, mm -hmm. And like, if someone like, I, I mean, I just, I remember thinking like, oh, God, I wish that like a Benson had come and like kidnapped me, like, <laughs> which was like the most like bizarre, weird thing to feel. But like, I would, it was kind of like worth digging into and, 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 you know, it was like that, that was what made me think, okay, I can spend a year on this. Like I, this, this little relationship here, um, and sort of diving into what it means to these two um is you know was always at the at the heart of it um because i like i i probably wouldn't have necessarily chosen to do another like two-hander you know two guys movie right after swallowed but like mm -hmm. because the relationship was so different and the characters were so interesting yeah. I was like, you know what? Like, let's, let's, let's go. Uh, like two movies in one year. Like when am I ever going to get the chance to do that again? So, yeah. yeah. And how, how were Kyle and Johnny, like, how did they add to that? I feel like Johnny was a uh, an actor that like, he was, he was like welling up almost every scene, almost how yeah. it seemed like, which was fantastic. And Kyle is obviously like a horror staple now with hunting in Connecticut and the remake of nightmare yeah, of and scream and smile and all this different stuff. Yeah. All of it. I mean, I, you know, it was interesting because the, they're, they're so good together and like, we didn't get a chance to do like any chemistry reads or, you know, any, any of that together. So I sort of, I sort of had to like think about them separately and sort of imagine them together, which I guess, you know, that's, that's fairly normal in casting. Right. Um, but you know, with, with Johnny, with, with the Randy's character, it's like, he spends so much time listening and so much time not talking, you know, I, I wanted to, I, I love how much Johnny is able to s s do and say with his face without words. Um, and then with, with Kyle, like as soon as his name came up, it was like, okay, yes, him, Kyle, a hundred percent. Like <laughs> he has this ability to sort of flash between, you know, leading man, char charismatic, charming, and like psychopath batshit crazy. Yeah. Like yeah. that's like a, like a, you know, that's a sweet spot. <laughs> that's it. That's yeah. his kind of like his sweet spot. And, and there's not a lot of, you know, there's not a lot of people that can do that convincingly. And there's not a lot of people that can, you know, keep you, uh, I mean, I'm sure there are a lot of people actually, but like, the, you know, there's something super special about Kyle and the way that he is able to maneuver those very subtle, um, kind of shifts, character yeah. shifts. It both charming and uh, completely untrustworthy it, sometimes in the same shot uh yes. with the same yeah, face, like, yeah exactly on. within the same shot like with a yeah. beat to beat by beat like he it, it shifts and it's so yeah. exciting to watch um 
and they're both so like you know they're both so good in these in these close-ups and i knew that like so much of this movie takes place in the car and it was going to be claustrophobic and there's a lot of really talky scenes there's a lot mm -hmm. of talking and mm -hmm. i you know i knew that these faces had to be like spectacular <laughs> you know not only the performances but just like the the, the ability to, to to keep us interested as an audience when we're not looking, we're not looking at explosions or, you know, any of that shit. We're looking at like faces listening. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, yeah. absolutely. It's I um I have to ask a, a little bit. So did you was it intentional to have us wondering like what direction this whole this whole movie was going to go? I know that pretty early on me and Steve were looking at each other like, is it? it's got to be fight club, right? Like, is it going to be fight club? We were wondering if, if, you know, Benson was just the inner fresh sure, no. of Randy's. Yeah. 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 And Steve like, has, you're not, specific... the only, you're not the only people like, you're no? not the only okay. people to think that. Like, it's funny. Cause I, I never even once thought that until I read it in a YouTube comment. Interesting. <laughs> really? Interesting. Yeah. Like that was the first time it ever even occurred to me was when I, when the trailer came out and someone, someone posted that. So I it, do have to say, I think that Benson's outfit reminds me so much of Brad Pitt's final Tyler Durden outfit. Like the the way the uh, the relationship between like the way that the character acts and then this fuzzy cardigan that he has on. <laughs> Uh -huh. It's just this like very interesting dichotomy, and it happens in in Fight Club too, where Brad Pitt's like at the end of the movie, he's a complete asshole, and but he's wearing this huge fur coat um with a tank yeah. top underneath it so i was like that yeah. has to be a tyler durden reference but to to know that that didn't even hit your yeah yeah your I mean, for me it was it, it was it was a kurt cobain reference for me oh that was like that's fair I, too. I, I, I liked the idea of like a grunge sort of you know benson like taking a mohair sweater from his grandmother and sure. you know and it was like his last you know piece that he had from her um, yeah more than more than you know tyler durden i love sure, i love it's... that the costume piece adds so much to his character yeah, <laughs> yeah. we, we spent a lot of time dying like i had a very specific shade of green that i wanted and i wanted you know mohair and so the costume designer to her credit she like did like three four batches to get that shade of green Hell like, yeah. we, had, we we had to work hard to get that specific green and 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 we left with like at the end of the at the end of the shoot we were all like um can i get a sweater do you have extras of those sweaters? <laughs> so like I have one, Laura and the producer has one. I think Johnny has one and Kyle has one. Nice. So, that's so, oh, that's yeah. so good. <laughs> yeah. I, I want one. Um, I, it's so I, funny to me that, that that's, that that hadn't even like crossed your mind until the YouTube thing. Cause we were se seriously like halfway into the move. Even, even when people were clearly talking with Benson, you know, we were yeah. like, we were trying to justify it in our head and like, how, how, can, how is he going to make this work? Yeah. yeah there were multiple and, times but, where they, they addressed him and we were like, all right, yeah, this has to be over. We yeah, also, he's a, I will he's a person in the room. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I will say with the beginning uh, or with like the title, right the passenger sean and i from the get-go were like all right he either has a parasite or he's an alien or like something yeah, you know because we expecting... you yeah oh, yes nice. but what he... does it say about us that like we don't just accept that like humans can do bad things it has to be something else you know well, like mean... that's i feel like there's something <laughs> somewhere <laughs> we, we removed the humanity but from it yeah. you have just have yeah. active imaginations that's all yeah <laughs> yeah that's, just that's probably horror fair. space we're looking for the weird um yeah yeah, it's, I, uh, yeah. especially like he throws up in the bathroom at the teacher's house. And I was like, all right, this is where there's going to be a test. <laughs> this is where the parasite surfaces. Yeah, yeah, something, no. something is. <laughs> I, one it's thing. Funny I mean, Eric, yeah. Eric, the editor and I, we like, we never talked about it. Like it's, it's, it's really fun to hear that. So all, of, all this, all this stuff. Oh, it's like it's, a perfect vehicle for that story. Versions. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it's, it's great that it's just humans too. I mean, there's a film, yes. I don't know if you've seen it called God bless America, which is like very, it, it has a different, tone than this film it's also like watching it now i don't think it's written that well but it, it's basically like an old man and a, and a younger girl like decide that they're fucking done with everything and and go on this yeah. like you know road trip uh essentially it's very yeah. similar to the passenger in that sense i'm i'm curious though along those lines we were talking about the beginning of the film it starts off strong like you you know it, it has a bit of a build-up as as uh randy's you know getting to work but then um, I won't spoil it, but you start off very strong. <laughs> yeah, and horrible stuff I'm, happens. Yeah, um, and I'm I'm wondering how hard it is to keep that momentum. Like you, obviously, yeah. the the film gets 
heartfelt as you were speaking about gets heartfelt at certain moments i think you do a great job of keeping the momentum through the film but is it daunting to know that you're gonna do that you know before the first act is done and then have to continue through the rest of the film and maintain that um yeah i mean i you know what it, it originally in the script i think it happened on page like 35 or 40 mm. and so from the beginning i was like no this has to happen 10 minutes in like by the time we're 10 yeah. minutes in this needs to have happened so yeah. that a we we know that that benson is capable of anything and i, I felt like it was the the most important kind of scene for creating this possibility that um he might hurt Randy and that, and that, you know, to keep that tension. Cause I think once you've established that kind of tension, then you get a little bit of a, you know, you can, you sort of like, like Randy as an audience, we sort of get lulled into being won over by Benson's charm and his character yeah. and his like witty conversations. And so I liked that, that rhythm of like, Oh no, he's horrible. No, he's, a, he's doing bad <laughs> shit. And then like, Oh, you know, but then 10 minutes later you like him again. Yeah. yeah. It, honestly, Benson kind of, this sounds, this is just a a manifestation <laughs> of general societal frustrations for me, so nobody look into this too much. But to be honest, Benson kind of won me over the second that he just said, fuck it. Um, <laughs> I think that there's a, a little bit uh, uh, of everyone that just wishes that you could take care of problems, you know what I mean, and, and sort of get out those frustrations. Obviously not in a, a real way, but... E I'm just trying to say Benson is a uh, is a likable character, a confusingly likable character the whole time. Yes, exactly. Confusingly, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Me too. Yeah. I um. So one thing we want to talk about uh, that's slightly related to pass. I, I think that there's there's moments that maybe tie into this in in the passenger, but that you've spoken about a lot in your film um, career that's close to you is where queerness and horror intersect. Um, mm -hmm. I you know obviously like with with swallowed with bug crush um there's a lot of very pre prevalent elements in other films maybe a little bit less so um but even other work that you do with photography still you know touches on on queerness and horror i know that back when bug crush was coming out you spoke about how growing up those two things ran parallel to each other like there wasn't a lot of intersection yeah, um, yeah. and and that kind of made you want to create that intersection i'm curious now as we see so much more representation in film um, specifically in horror with what these films are talking about, um, even the, the smaller ones that come out on Shudder to, to big motion pictures. Um, I'm curious on your thoughts on queerness and representation in the horror genre and, and why it's like a perfect space to, to advocate for, for all of that representation. Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, representation matters. Like at the end of the day, like representation matters, whether it's whether it's queer representation or, you know, the representation of different size and shape bodies and like different capability, like all of it matters. And, and, and seeing yourselves in the films that you love is like incredibly powerful for mm -hmm. kids and for young audiences and, and for, and for older audiences that have, have never gotten the chance to, you know, to, to see it themselves. Um, I, I feel like now we're sort of entering this, incredible time when like because all of these smaller indie movies are getting made and we are getting films from so many amazing filmmakers like you know alice mackie mckay and yeah. robbie banfitch's the outwaters and like there's sort of like this barrier to entry is gone and just like anybody can tell their story or the story that they want to tell and th i mean that's super exciting i think that there's probably a long way to go in terms of you know representation on on bigger scope yeah projects um you know but at least now they're, they're you know those films are out there and they're and they are being made and and even if they you know you have to look really hard to find them and they're not maybe perfect or they're not as slick or polished as as maybe what you're used to and you know not all of them are great like there's you know there's there's some that are better than others, I think, but like at the end of the day, like they're there and that's, that's so exciting. Absolutely. Um, and, and, you know, I, I obviously, you know, I, I had none of that growing up. Um, so I feel like I'm like, you know, working overtime to make up for, you know, lost representation. Yeah. yeah like what you didn't yeah. get when you were growing up. That makes yeah. sense. Yeah. Sure. 
especially especially in the horror space it's such a it's such a great thing to see all of these you know these different voices you know especially uh, from places like marginalized communities and, and things like that it's it's a perfect uh playground to to kind of explore those those feelings and and uh you know those experiences and stuff it, i mean obviously you worked with with mark Patton on uh swallowed and stuff so yeah yeah it's what, just a and and horror audiences also are incredibly like open hard yeah. like open mm-hmm. open armed and open hearted and like you know i ran into so many like horror bros uh, like cuz i was on the road with swallowed for months and months and months and so like i was i was really like oh i don't know if how this is going to go like are are mm-hmm. people going to get feel like they got suckered into watching something that they like you know i tricked them or mm-hmm. and you know i had i had so many amazing conversations with with these like straight horror bros who you know kind of fell for the film in a way that would they took them by surprise and like that was so exciting because you know those experiences are kind of universal they don't you know they don't they're they're not um they're not happening to just straight love stories or you know you don't have to be straight and white to fall in love with your best friend and you don't have to you know fit into like some sort of marketable saleable uh you know conventional way of telling stories in order to you know feel seen yeah absolutely yeah couldn't have could not have said it better um complete subject turn uh, i know that we're getting close to time here but i, I want to bring yeah. it up a little bit uh watching the ruins because i you know prepping for this interview i recently retook in the ruins after after several years and and got to see swallowed and and watch bug crush and i know it's not the only place you hang out you've done ghost story you've done uh yeah. i think how did you word it uh coming of age hostage road trip thrillers um yeah but bugs and plants seems like such a fun place for for you specifically to hang out and i'm just curious if if there's any like bug or plant horror um that that really sticks out to you or or i was thinking like audrey too while watching the ruins and um yeah Um, i you know i had never i had never like i don't think i'd ever seen any kind of plant horror before the ruins like honestly um I, you know, maybe it's like growing up in the woods in a small town, mm. you know, in Maine or like on the coast here, like where basically like I can't see another house in any direction. And it's like there are it's definitely, you know, the nature is everything and everywhere and like super um, terrifying at times, <laughs> um, you know, more than. I mean, I think that the other thing that that both of those have in common maybe is like the body thing. And yeah, the, the idea of invasive. of your body being invaded or your body losing control of your body and 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 that I think probably has a lot to do with like growing up at a time when like I was petrified of HIV and AIDS. Like mm. I grew up in the eight late eighties, okay. early nineties, and so I was like, you know, every mark, every bump, I was like, oh, I'm gonna die. I'm like, I, I was so like kind of petrified of, of my body turning against me, you know sure. what I mean? In, in Like in a way. And so I think that that probably has a big, like psychological hook that like, hasn't let me go. <laughs> you, uh, you just made me realize something. Like <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm a, I'm kind of a hypochondriac. I'm specific. I have like a, a lot of anxieties about cancers and stuff like that. And uh-huh. parasitic movies have always been some of the most like the hardest, even as a an intense horror fan with a podcast, uh, some of the hardest for me to get through. And I think when I think plant horror, I think of fun stuff like like Audrey 2 and, and Little Shop or uh, or The Happening, which I didn't uh-huh. really yeah. like rewatching yeah. The Ruins. I was like, you know, there's elements of this that if you that if you are watching it with the lights on with the you know a bunch of friends could seem kind of goofy but i was watching it in the dark and i was like this is terrifying and i couldn't <laughs> yeah, i think you're making me realize that my hypochondria like why you found it is, so uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah so thanks for the free therapy session uh, yeah, okay. happy to happy to help happy to yeah help. I'll, I'll explore that over the next three months and yeah. <laughs> get yeah. back to you oh god that's but, so i was like oh yeah sean's gonna yeah. have something to say about that yes yeah, well uh, <laughs> Carter, we are uh, at the end of the conversation, which means we are at the moment of the the episode that we call mostly horror recommendations. So 
Um, essentially, what we like to ask all of our guests is that you provide us with uh, one horror film and then maybe a non-horror film that you think our listeners should check out. Um, feel free to take a second if you need to. Uh, but okay, whatever, uh, whatever you think that uh, our listeners. I mean, should... I would say for for horror film, <laughs> like the one that I am, I just love, which I feel like not enough people have seen, is The Untamed. The Untamed. Hmm. I don't know. I don't know if I've on Shutter. Um... It is a sort of cosmic sexual monster drama um, interesting it's really good and really okay. dark and and if you're doing nothing tonight like watch it immediately if you're not hooked in the first three minutes then um there's something wrong with you okay what's the i mean it's it's, it, it's messed up <laughs> what's the country of origin do you know is uh it a... is it is it spain i was gonna say is it spanish it's... I'm trying to it's, tell yeah, by a, quickly looking. Yeah, it's it's in Spanish. Uh, uh, the I think that the okay. the American title is The Untamed, and it's called the Savage, La Région Savage, or the, like which is French, but like it's not a French movie. It's a it's a <laughs> South American film. Um, okay, and I'm for blanking on the director's name, but he also uh, he did he hasn't done another another film in quite a while. But so The Untamed is one, and it's on Shutter, I believe. Okay. Um, he did, and um, a Ma- I don't want to get his name wrong. Um, Amat Escalante. Escalante, yes, right, yeah, yeah. or yeah. I mean, some that's a butchered, butchered version of of his name, I'm sure. <laughs> um, but it's so good, so okay. so good, right. and it's Hell it's yeah. it's, it's, is... it's everything that I like in a horror movie, which is like it's super like stylish and and creepy, and like the photography is beautiful, and it's got like elements of. You know, there's queerness in a that's shown in a really interesting way. There's an incredible monster. Um, it's 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 a five star in my opinion. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. What, what um, a great. And, I love a and rap. And then like non horror, like horror adjacent. I've been like kind of into recently the these um, Eloy de Iglesias movies, um, which I mean I watch English movies too. I just so you know I don't watch only Spanish language <laughs> movies, but like he made all of these like juvenile delinquent movies in uh spain in the late 70s and early 80s and he did this thing where he would cast real delinquents as the stars of his films and you know tell these stories about like you know drug dealing thieving bands of like teenage boys who were running rampant in the cities and you know there's this kind of amazing backstory about how like this one kid who became his like main star. And so there's, there's one called Navajeros. There's one called El Pico. And then there's El Pico two. They're all on shutter actually. Um, okay. And, you know, he was this gay director that, that kind of, he had, he fell, I don't know. I don't know exactly how in love or how not in love, but the, his main star who became like the number one teen idol in Spain during this time, who was a real live heroin addict as they, were dating you know the characters that he would play was a heroin addict and he became a heroin addict in in real life as well um but they had this like you know kind of weird protective relationship where he didn't want to let this actor you know act in anyone else's movies even though he was the most famous you know teen idol in in spain and they're they're really kind of interesting they're and they're worth checking out i'm I have to check it out now. Just, just. I was going to say, okay. Films that have those sort of backstories too are always like, yeah, they have that extra layer of, of you know, interest to Why them. This like, is interesting. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Well, because he he made a he started in like exploitation and, and horror movies. He did like Cemetery Man, and he did some other films. But then like he made this block of like four or five of these. They're called Kinkies, which is hmm. like that's the name for like the juvenile delinquent like little genre um and yeah it, it it um they're they're kind of fascinating to look at no knowing like read a little bit about the backstory as you watch them and and it'll be even more fascinating wow absolutely what great Excited rex we have okay. we all have homework yeah. to do which is amazing i love i'm happy homework. to give you rex that you have not heard of and have not <laughs> yeah. seen that's like yes. always yeah my, 
stoked yeah. on it. It's yeah. what we strive yeah. for. Some listen, you know, yeah. not to I'm not gonna call out anyone, but sometimes we get like the thing and we're like, all right, yeah, it's a great film, but yeah, like, it's right. something Which cool. is <laughs> still yeah, like we, it's okay to have that yeah, bit of appreciation, one, but, but it is always exciting <laughs> when we get stuff like I have no clue what either of these are. Perfect. Yeah, I'm you know, you no, get yeah. on a Spanish movie rabbit hole. <laughs> yes, oh man. <laughs> honestly. There we go. Well, Carter, we we really appreciate the time. Uh, I want to reiterate anyone listening to this, go check out The Passenger now, MGM Plus. I'm sure it's other places VOD as well. Um, Carter, thank you again so much for being on the show. We really appreciate it. Thank you guys so much for listening to our conversation with Carter. And thank you to Carter for joining us uh, this week. It is now time for the, I was about to call it the most important part of our episode. It's probably not the most important part of our episode. Um, I'm about to have a belt fall off of my chair, so it's going to make a loud noise. Boom. Um, mostly horror recommendations. Do you, do you got one, Sean? Do you want me to go first? Yeah, you go first. Mine's, mine's kind of complicated. You go first. All right. We'll go from there. I'm all over. Um, we're recording this on July 30th. Barbenheimer weekend was last weekend and instead of participating sean and i went to go see cobweb i have now completed my barbenheimer journey um and i would love to recommend both films uh we'll start with the horror that is oppenheimer um i saw oppenheimer in the largest imax in north america it was amazing (laughs) it is a visceral experience a an amazing character study um and i'm not gonna you know it's hard to spoil a historical thing but i don't want to spoil like the the context of the film itself sure um but i guess i'll just frame it by saying it's not about the bomb the film is called oppenheimer it's not called you know little boy or whatever the fucking bomb was called um big fat boy and little man or whatever they were called um that's what they were called they had dumb ass really names. yeah dom had oh. a dom uh from i the duck had a great tweet about it dom said uh calling the atomic bombs fat man and little boy will never not sound so insane to me i will never get over it the only explanation that would make sense is if it's one of those i think you should leave kind of arg- arguments where one really weird guy was really really insistent which is totally fair. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's it's not about the bomb. It is about Oppenheimer. It is a great, great uh, character study that gets very existential, gave me a lot of anxiety at the end. Um, it is three hours long, but doesn't feel like it. It is so well acted. Um, the pacing is amazing. Ludwig uh, Goranson, who did the score, is just um we talked with chris dudley about this but it is just like unparalleled one of the best film scores i've ever ever yeah. heard uh, he was really the, selling that yeah hoita van hoitema who's the um director of photography who also did nope um the film is beautiful it's just it is a 10 out of 10 work of art um but i truly wish that i would have seen barbie right after oppenheimer because after seeing it today a couple hours ago I have not laughed and smiled that much in a film front to front to end front to back uh, in quite a long time. I cried multiple times uh, once a couple of times from laughing and once from a very heartfelt moment. Uh, Ryan Gosling is, I, I really hope that the Academy makes not makes an exception, but like doesn't, look over it because it's a comedic performance like it is such a good performance um that i really hope he gets nominated it is i like can't explain enough how great it is um and there was a point i was saying this when we were almost done with the film but there was a point about a third of the way through the film where i was like yeah this is good but i don't know if it's gonna really you know like i've seen everyone say this is an amazing movie like i don't know if it's gonna leave me with that lasting impression but Mm -hmm. it is one of the best films that I've seen in a, a really long time. And the fact that I saw two nearly perfect films in one weekend is amazing. So Hell yeah. everyone listening, go watch Oppenheimer in the biggest theater possible. 
go watch Barbie in a packed theater because it will be packed because this film is probably next week or the week after going to be at a hundred or at a uh, billion dollars um, worldwide. Like it's doing fucking amazing. Um, we saw it with a packed theater and it's just 10 out of 10. So Hell those yeah. are my recs. I'm Damn. recommending Barbenheimer. Do, do the Barbenheimer. Yeah. Do do the Barbenheimer. Do the Barbenheimer. The they need to come up with a new dance called the Barbenheimer. Yeah, <laughs> the Barbenheimer. Okay, solid Rex. Uh, obviously, I will I will be seeing both of those movies um, sometime yes. when I'm back in the city um, and excited to do it. My Rec. So uh, I just went to I just went to MCN, guys. I went to a horror convention in my hometown, Motor City Nightmares, which I've talked about uh, frequently. I had a blast. Um, yeah, it was a really good time. I'm bummed. I was supposed to see, I, I'm going to get to my rec. We're going to talk about this and it'll lead me to my rec and why and stuff like that. But, uh, got to, uh, Bruce Campbell was there this year. This was the first mm. year that he was here. This, I love this convention because it's, it's small, it's intimate, but it is very credible. They, uh, they always get like really great people. This is the same convention that at the after parties I have sat and talked with uh, Tyler Maine, you know, who plays Sabretooth and X-Men at one point. He plays uh, Michael Myers in Rob Zombie's remake Halloween's uh, Heather Langenkamp, um, you know, uh, Megan Foster, uh, Matthew Lillard, Sid Haig, Bill Mosley. Like I've gotten to, to really chat with all these people because of this convention this year, Bruce Campbell was there when they have people this, that big, they kind of put them in their own room. Like yeah. it's, it is, they are king of the castle. Um, and, uh, and dude, Bruce Campbell was there. I didn't even see him. I didn't even see him. It was so packed this year that wow. I didn't even see his face at any point. We were going to get an autograph because usually I go with some money to get a handful of different trinkets and stuff. And this year I was mm -hmm. like, no, I don't need to buy stuff. I'm just going to spend some money on the autograph. I had, I brought my, uh, my evil dead Two VHS was ready to sign it. And we learned the convention just that normally this convention is great, but they were very confusing this year. And when we went to get in line on Sunday to do it, because we thought that that would be the least packed day, we were wrong. It was packed the whole weekend. Um, we get there and apparently you were supposed to pre-buy an autograph ticket. So there's already a line wrapping just mm -hmm. to just for the people with the tickets trying to get his autograph. We had to get in another line to buy to the, ticket. the ticket so that we could then get in line to go. And uh, we waited in that line for about 25 minutes and then uh, found out the prices were pretty high and um, – and saw it not moving at all. And yeah, if we had followed through, we probably would have been waiting in line for like three to four hours. Damn. Um, yeah. Yep. Seriously. So, so we called it, didn't get to do that, but overall I, I had a great time, man. We, uh, we made some friends, we drank, saw a bunch of cool stuff. I bought some VHSs. I shouldn't, uh, I bought nice. some shirts. I shouldn't, uh, um, I'll show you them at another time, but another guest that was there was Felisa Rose. Uh, and for Felissa Rose, sorry, not Lisa. I don't know why I said that. Felissa Rose, um, she is a scream queen icon. Uh, for those who know, uh, I don't have to explain it, obviously, but for those who don't know, she stars in a movie called Sleepaway Camp, um, the 1983 American slasher film uh, that is now considered one of the like trans community icon movies. It's controversial. Mm -hmm. It's wacky. This movie is wacky, dude. Um, it's been a minute since I've seen it, but getting to meet her, which by the way, she was so nice. Um, Cameron, you know, did the official picture signed, got a, uh, a print signed by her. And she looked at me and Olivia and was like, can I hug you guys too? And we all got a picture and we just chatted for a bit. So after my great experience with Felissa Rose, I'm recommending sleepaway camp to everybody, whether it's been a minute since you've seen it, or if you've never seen it, uh, if for no other reason there's a certain shot um, that is just famous that everybody, every horror fan needs to experience at one time or another, I'm not going to tell you anything else about it. Uh, I think, I think it's a, just the kind of movie that just needs to be seen. So interesting. I've never seen yep. sleepaway camp, so I should watch it. I didn't think that you did. And I know that you are going to, you are going to find it. Like, I think we should watch it 
with like cam or something like if there's okay. any way we can even if we got to facetime him in or something because i think if you just watch it or like you and sydney watch it you're gonna be like that was weird um <laughs> yeah but, i don't it's not a film that i'm expecting to love but sure uh just based on the the decade and the yeah the style it's not film, your but... kind of movie but it is an incredibly important horror movie for yeah, sure absolutely um yeah hell yeah that's a good wreck yep. um sleepaway camp barbie oppenheimer all very similar films um as always <laughs> uh if you want to tell us about your thoughts on the scream rumors if you want to tell us your thoughts about Please barbenheimer do. if you want to tell us your thoughts about haunted mansion did you see haunted mansion because i'm probably not going to until it's on disney plus um send us an email mostly horror movie night at gmail.com let us know what you thunk uh you can also send us an email nope i already said that you can send us a dm on instagram at mostly horror pod um i'm not going to call it x but you can contact us on twitter at mostly horror and we also got some tiktok that is also at mostly horror uh if you want to watch our interviews on youtube watch us do the talking um, you can do that on YouTube, mostly horror. We got um, a lot of our recent episodes up there and all of our upcoming episodes will be on there as well. And I'm everywhere at Stephen is average. Sean's on all the socials at hypocrite.inc or hypocrite Inc. Anything else? I think that's it. I think that's it. We'll catch you next week. Goodbye.